Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis, and today I have Brian Cantor on. Uh, uh, Brian is somebody who's been involved with Infinity and Anderson for years, going through from the client side. Uh, but one of the beautiful things about working with people over the years is you get to know them and you get to know uh, kind of the what they're made of and what their values are. And we have a lot of alignment with Brian, and he's a great uh, client, great great member of the Infinity community great member of the uh, Anderson community. So we're lucky to have him. So Brian, uh, welcome back. I know we've done some podcasts with you before, but welcome back today. Uh, thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'm a charter member of Infinity. I went to your very first uh, thing in uh, New Orleans back when we were uh, dodging the hurricane. <laughs> oh yeah. That was when it was just a, a, a uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I don't know how much we've ever gotten into the, why we created Infinity, but um did we ever have that conversation, Brian? I, I'm not, I don't think so. I don't want to take away from the topic of today, which is really about the individual versus indexes, but, um, but the infinity side, cause I'm on the, I'm on the backside of doing a lot of work for a lot of people that are investors. And so we work with a lot of groups that teach people how to invest so that we can handle the tax implications of the investments that they're engaged in. So, for example, if you're in syndications, it's very different than if you're a, a trader versus if you're a long term investor versus if you're into real estate versus if you're a small business person. They all come with their with 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 different issues. And so we were used to working on the backside, but I started noticing patterns. So being in this 20 plus years, you start noticing that, for example, on the trading side. Uh, you would see consistent results from different groups. And uh, what I started getting really frustrated at, on is the people that had the short-term uh, horizons were just getting killed. And, I, and we always said it was about 80% would lose money. Uh, internally, I would talk to the accountants and they would say it's actually higher. And then stats came out that showed it was about 95% of people that are trying to time the market uh, lose money. And I'm talking about not lose all their money, but lose money. They do not make money off of their investments. Uh, and so more and more that I studied it, I started talking to clients that were successful. I'd had my mentors over the years and I had folks that I'd worked with over the years. And I said, what are the common attributes? And then can I create rules around those attributes? And I listed the help of uh, a number of other uh, what I would call kind of conservative investors, David McShane, uh, who recently passed and so a horrible loss, but he and I would sit around and talk about this stuff because he was a fiduciary, grew up in banking. Dad was a banker, brother was a banker. He left traditional banking because he didn't like what they were doing to the consumer and became a CFP and was a, a fiduciary on behalf of his clients. And we would sit here and talk about uh, how to make sure people don't get hurt. You know, and rule number one is, you know, it's not the return on my money, it's the return of my money, kind of, kind of like making sure that they don't throw money away. And we came up with seven rules that we would work on over and over again that became the foundation of the infinity principles. Uh, David worked at Sage, which had billions of dollars under management and made money even during the downturn to the market. And he brought that wisdom with him. And uh, we would just sit there and come up with these things. And one of the areas that we struggled with uh, the most, I would say, was do we bring people through the idea of investing in individual stocks or should they be going in diversification? And before we went on camera, we were talking about diversification. What were you saying about Buffett? Buffett had, Buffett had some comments on diversification. Yeah, Buffett's quote was, uh, um, diversification is protection against ignorance. Uh, it makes little sense if you know what you're doing. <laughs> it, and it's really interesting that, the, the, A, that is Buffett to a T, yeah. Uh, because he, he's the grandfather of uh, value investing, if you want to call it that, or the father of value investing. The Columbia has a great value investing school. I believe it's all uh, from, from Buffett. Um, and at least the principal ideas are all from Buffett, which is the idea that you can, you can buy companies that are undervalued if you understand their balance sheet. Um, and you understand how to actually value them. You could use, you know, we won't dive into that, but I don't know how you learn the principles just going into indexes. I like indexes because it's a bucket of stocks to a certain degree, but you won't learn anything doing indexes necessarily. If you want to learn about a company, you actually have to uh, buy into a company. And then and we always say the only way to learn to do something is to do it. So you kind of have to start on the individual company. 
route. And that was what our conclusion was, was that what's best for investors is to learn as much as they can about what they're investing in. And the only way you could do that is by getting into the, into the micro. Either you've run a company, you've been uh, along for the ride as companies go public, or you've worked with a publicly traded company, you've run your own, or you buy into a publicly traded company on the stock exchange and learn about its numbers and learn kind of the way it works, like you buy shares. But you brought up and wrote an article recently on uh, indexes versus individual stocks. And it was so enlightening that I actually said, hey, let, Brian, let's have a conversation about it and bring it out to everybody. What did you find out in your studies? And I know you use uh, Jeremy Siegel um, and his books uh, and his studies. What did you find out and what were your conclusions after digging in? Yeah, it was funny. Uh, and again, I'm not real brilliant on this. I, I read a couple of books. Uh, uh, that is is one of his. Uh, Jeremy Stiegel is from uh, Work School of Business, and um, he's a professor there. But um, back in uh, just around 2000, 98, 99, 2000, um, uh, a book came out from uh, Fisher, and uh, I forget who his co-author was on that. But uh, uh, they did a piece and said, hey, the indexes are good because the indexes are constantly re, re, constantly refreshing. You know, they're putting in, let's cut out the dead weight, put in the new up and comers and that kind of thing. Right. And they published an article that said, if, if um, you know, the index had not been refreshing, uh, then they would have uh, your, the returns would have been 20% lower. You know, it's those new vibrant growing companies added to the index that are really causing the thing to go. And, uh, uh, Siegel said up until that point that that had kind of been his perception as well. And it's mm -hmm. kind of what he'd been teaching and practicing in his own, uh, uh, in his own investing and things like that. But uh, it, it caused him to question. He said, well, maybe if the, if the new, if those new companies are the ones that are doing so great, maybe I shouldn't hold the old index. I should just hold those new companies. And he did a little bit of analysis on that. He goes, Oh, wait a minute. This is not turning out as well as I, I expected. So we went back and did a very comprehensive study. You, know, you can enlist when you're at, when you're a professor. You can enlist graduate students to do all your nug work for you, right? So they they amassed just an, an enormous amount of data on the S and P index from 1957 uh, when it was established up through 2003, and just the real high level conclusions there was that if you had invested a thousand bucks in 1957 in the index as a whole and just held it, you know, as they, as they pulled up companies out, put new companies in and things like that, it'd be worth uh, 125 K. So 125 times return over that, you know, 43 year period. And, Standard. And, you know, Standard. That, exactly, right? Right. and that's great. Right. You'd stop and say, we hear these numbers all the time. Hey, if you, if, if you invest over the long term, you're going to get these huge compounding, you're going to get compounding. Oh my gosh. But what, what happened when they looked at the companies that were a little more six, that, like when they started looking at the individual companies? Yeah. So the, the top company, and obviously, you know, it's easier to look back and find the top company than forward, but the top company over that period of time that stayed in the index. So it was still in the index. Uh, and it turned out to be Philip Morris, uh, which is now, uh, there's a Philip Morris, but Altria is uh, mm -hmm. probably the more common uh, company, but uh, that company would have been worth if you bought a thousand, put a thousand bucks in in 1957 in that company. By 2003, it would have been worth 46 million dollars. How much? 46 million dollars. 46. One investment. Yeah, it its rate of return beat the index by almost 30 percent per year um, in that one stock, right? And the funny thing is, back then, if you looked at it, it Philip Morris is as boring then as it is now. It wasn't like this was the you know the headline news stock that everybody was saying, "Hey, you got to have Philip Morris." You know, this is the up and comer, right? Um, lots of uh, IBM uh, was a tech company back then, and it was really kind of high profile. Um, it hasn't done badly, but uh, it, it didn't even come close to that level of performance. It's interesting. So, so um, I got to unpack that. I got to get my head around this $46 million versus 125. So if you bought the index, you'd still be pretty happy. 125,000. Like, wow. Like I've gone up a hundred times, but 46 million. I don't even know how many times that's 
that's a multiple of it's like ridiculous it's at, that that's exponential growth yeah right? and, and that's the key right the compounding and so for, from that he went back and looked back and said okay why is this the case and you know that it goes against common wisdom because like you talked about diversification means usually you've got better security you're mm -hmm. less uh, you know uh susceptible to but high volatility eggs in a basket. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. A bunch of eggs, you know, um, and a bunch of baskets, I guess is the best way to put it. So they, he found a couple of principles. One key one, right, was uh, the dividends and dividend reinvestment. When Foster uh, had done his report, he was just looking at, hey, if I had bought 100 shares of the index, you know, back mm -hmm. then, and what would those hundred shares be worth based on the appreciation of price? But he wasn't taking account into total return, which was yeah, reinvested dividends, dividends uh, which accumulates more shares, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, with smaller price fluctuation, you can gain more value, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Through the accumulation of shares. And that's really where you get compound growth. If you look at price growth over time in the S&P, it's, it, it's a little tiny bit exponential, but it's, it's primarily linear. Um, but if you're compounding by buying more shares, uh, then you get that exponential growth. And so uh, I'm sure most of that growth came at, at you know, the tail end, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't at the very beginning where it was significant. Time value of money goes exponential. Yeah. So you don't, you, it doesn't go this, it goes zip and right on up. Yeah. Interesting. So there, was, uh, there was another factor that he found out too, and that was, um, the, and this was kind of his overriding thing. He said, usually those high performers, by the time they got added to the index, mm -hmm. were overpriced. And he said, you can, if you, if you buy a stock that's overpriced, it's going to impact your long-term results on that company, whether it pays a dividend or not. You know, even if you have a good dividend payer, you, you don't want to pay too much for it. You don't want it to be overpriced uh, because if you're buying it when it's overpriced, your, your long-term retur returns on that are going to be significant. And that's your, that's your PE ratio. Like if you were going to look at it, did, did he have any specific type of ratio that he was looking at or tracking? Yeah, it, it was interesting. And, and this in the article may have been a little bit, um, uh, uh, it, it might have caused a little tiny bit of confusion. So he did put a, 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 a table in his and he showed what the average PE for the top 20 performers was. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was a little like uh, uh, Philip Morris was down around 13, 13.3. Um, a couple of those were up higher, um, something like Abbott Labs or something like that was up in the 20s. Um, and so but not, that, but not not 80. Oh, yeah. No, I, I looked up a, a couple of P's today just for just for giggles. Amazon, good, solid company, right? Growth company. Uh, it's at 66. Um, everybody's poster child for high tech. I'm going to go, you know, is Tesla, right? Yeah, want any guess on what Tesla's PE ratio is? 400. <laughs> 621. Oh my God. And this is today after, you know, it had about a, what, about a 20, 30% drawdown over uh, the mm -hmm. last couple months. Um, so, yeah, things like that. Uh, Netflix is around 60, uh, NVIDIA uh, up around 89. And if you notice, almost none of those pay any kind of a dividend. Um, Apple, which is still in the tech group, um, but it pays a dividend and it's uh, so big right now that it's growth potential is kind of hampered. You know, it's, it's hard to go to, I mean, it's, it's easier to go to the first trillion in value than it is to go to the second trillion in value. Right. Yep. Um, so, but apples is uh, around 29, which is not super, super high, uh, but still. Elevated. We, we generally use, I remember again, this is one of these conversations that you're sitting around. At, I remember being at city arena with, with, with David having a beer watching uh, skating. <laughs> he was a big hockey player. So we were watching the Golden Knights, uh, some of the youth teams and stuff, and just kind of, and we, I remember having this conversation. It's weird how you remember specific things. Can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can remember that. Um, and we're sitting there arguing about, uh, because because a, a low PE means that you have, that that the earnings are really high compared to the, the share price. So like an AT and T may have a really high PE, but it's also a showing of of somewhat weakness as far as the company. Like it's 
you know, something's causing that. What's the problem with the companies? Like at t it's lots of debt, right? Um, and we, we decided like we like the 10 to 25 range and, and sometimes 15 to 25 might even be better because you want it to be fairly valued. You don't want to be paying too much. So uh, when when Siegel went through all this, because I, I, I know the book that you, what, that, that thick, it's got all the data in it. You're, you're telling me it's like a tomb. Did they come up with a, with a, with a range or with a number, magic number, what, what they're looking at? Well, he, he kind of kind of didn't kind of didn't. Uh, he actually was using P not necessarily as a measure per se of price, but of of investor expectations, which gets mm -hmm. reflected in price, right? If in, if expectations are for this rapidly growing uh, uh, earnings, and then the company doesn't produce those earnings, uh, then the performance uh, yeah is not as good as people expected it to be. But when they expect it to be high, they drive up the the uh, PE ratio, um, which means which means it's already been pushed up. Yes, you have a high PE it means that people are already they have high expectations. They've already priced it in, and a lot of that's driven by news. You know what's in the news? What's the hot, sexy thing this these days? And you know what's the high performer? And who's just gotten into this new industry that's just going to dominate the industry and drive it and that kind of thing? And and so those tend to be momentum uh, plays which really are for traders. And like you uh, uh, indicated, you know, only about 5% of traders end up being profitable. Um, and so if, if you have some skills as a momentum trader, then you might want to do that. But investors, long-term investors, um, you want to look at, at, at earnings and price stability and dividends uh, as coming in. So he, what he did find, and this alludes to what you were talking about, um, it wasn't necessarily the one, the, the long-term average during that time period for the S&P 500 index was just a little over 17, so 17 and a half or so. Um, and he found that the ones that, the top performers uh, usually were around that level or slightly above. So a couple were, were below, but uh, things that get too low, like you say, that might be indicative of, uh, of problems in the business, their, their earnings are hurting. Um, uh, and so what he really wanted to find was not the companies whose earnings are in trouble, but the companies whose price was low compared to their earnings, uh, because that's a reflection of investor expectations. He said 17 and a half, 20, 20, that, that, that type of range, or was he looking at something even uh, tighter? Uh, the lower, well, the lower ones were down to around 12. So, you know, the top performer is 13.3. Um, there were a couple in there that were lower around 12, uh, mm -hmm. nothing that was much lower than that. Now, and that was the other problem that I said about this chart, right? Because that chart showed the average PE over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, even if a company has a good average PE, um, there are periods of time when even that company can be overvalued. So you don't want to buy it when it's really high because number one, you're, you're clipping your dividend yield, right? The price is real high. The yield on that stock is going to be relatively low uh, compared to its history. Um, so you can, there are, there are sites you can go on. Uh, I think there's one macro trends. Uh, I use a couple sites where you can go in and you can find the historical average PE mm -hmm. of uh, different companies. Um, you want to see what directions it's going to, right? To a certain extent. Well, again, PE ratio should be one of those things that tends to revert to the median, median, mm -hmm. uh, right? And uh, because companies are also going to raise their dividends and things like that, um, as as their uh, as as mm -hmm. you know their their earnings increase and things like that. So you, that will be a, a revert to mean kind of thing. Um, you don't necessarily want to see something where the PE ratio is, is rising and rising and rising. You probably be the earnings aren't going up along with it. So if the PE ratio is going up, it means the company is becoming more expensive compared to what you're receiving. And, and you know? I will tell you right now, a lot of companies are very expensive right now. I mean, the market itself is, is very richly valued right now. As a matter of fact, by many metrics, it's as, as expensive as it's ever been. The um, expectation is high. Know, Individual. expectation is high like you said right expectation is high money is cheap so the expectation is that these companies are going to go invest right now give up some of their earnings to for the future and that you know 
the the killer is when the cheap money stops, interest rates go up, and then all these companies are going to drop because how do they meet their expectation if they're paying more debt service, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Particularly for the highly leveraged companies, um, which is the case for a lot of them because interest rates have been so low for so long. They've been encouraged to buy that. Did and he, stock buybacks, right? Yeah. That can artificially push the price up if they buy the number, if they do a share buyback um, instead of distributed dividend, it'll push right. the price up, but it won't necessarily do anything for the number of shares you have or, or the overall value. Or total did, did they dig into the yield at all and the dividend yields or was there, was, was there a, a, a range? Was there a yes dividends, no dividends? What, what, what um, was the analysis there? We did have a chart also, uh, and I included it in that report that showed what the average dividend being paid by the company over uh, long, long, that long period of time. Yeah, I'm looking and down at it. Those, and it, it was so interesting to me because I know in the seven criteria, you know, we're looking generally at something that's around three or higher. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those top performers, their average dividend was in that ballpark. 3.4. Uh, some, some of them a, little, a tiny bit lower, but you didn't have really anything that was down in the, the ones or, uh, or even low twos, really. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, kind of fun to look at where like these numbers were absolutely enlightening. Uh, I, and, uh, if, if you haven't read Brian's article, go read it. Uh, it's, it's there. It's indexes or individual stocks. And I think the answer is going to surprise you because, again, we've been taught so long, diversify, diversify, diversify. In fact, we use our diversification formula, but we buy individual stocks when we're starting. And again, that's where I usually get hit by financial advisors is they're mad that we're teaching individual stocks. So when I get negative feedback, it's almost always like, hey, I love what you're teaching. I understand the principles. But boy, it's risky to buy an individual stock. And I'm like, I don't think so. My, my conclusion was different. What would, what, what would Jeremy Siegel say? Yeah. Um, so he didn't, again, completely throw out indexing as, as a possibility, particularly depending on how much time uh, somebody wanted to put into it. But if you might, mind you, if, if you buy, uh, if your portfolio is around 20 stocks or something like that, um, and That's you're buying stable things, uh, one, another one of Buffett's quotes is our favorite hold time is forever. Yep. <laughs> which fits with infinity, right? That's we, we, we steal that just right on out, Brian. It's like, I have no problem with stealing what other smarter people say. Yeah. But this, the smaller basket dramatically outperformed the index. And here's what was the other thing. Um, this came out a little bit in, uh, in Siegel's book, but there's another book by a guy by the name of uh, James O'Shaughnessy. It's called what works on wall street. And he was also doing some PE, one of his chapters does a little bit of analysis on PE stocks and things like that. And what he finds is usually lower PE stocks tend to also have lower beta, right? So they're, um, they're, they're below the market beta. If the, the beta is a measure of volatility versus the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 is at one, uh, low beta stocks, say of 0.6 or 0.8 or something like that, are only going to move 60% either up or down mm -hmm. uh, as the index moved. Whereas most of these tech stocks, a lot of them are betas of, you know. You lose half, all the excitement of the Dow is down today and you run and look at your account and it Dow, if the Dow is down 20%, you're down 20%. If your beta is lower, you're not down 20%. You might, you might be down, but you're going to be down much less. So for example, the dividend Kings when in 2008, we had a, what a 38% drop in the market, the dividend Kings were down 14%. Like it was, it, it's a lot, you lose the big swings. You're, you're staying a smaller range. Right. And that's what O'Shaughnessy found. He said these, these low PE stocks, and he had a different way of, of, cycling those in as part of the portfolio but he said in your up years they're not up nearly as much as the the high pe stocks because those are the momentum performers mm -hmm. um, but he said in in down years they're usually down you know around half of what the market is down as opposed to these high flyers that are down one and a half two three times sometimes what the market is so if the market loses 30 40 percent sometimes those things are down 50 60 70 percent mm. um, the other thing is he showed 
if, if you look at one year period slices of time, um, the, the best years and the worst years are the, wor are the ones with the, uh, with the momentum stocks. But he said, if you look at a five year period of time, the low PE stocks always outperform. They have, they have smaller drawdowns and larger upside over five year periods of times than the momentum stocks. And when he extended that out to 10 year period of time, the average return on these low PE stocks over a 10 year period of time was 30% annual return uh annual 20, return. 26 to 30 percent depending you know there's a little bit of fluctuation in there um but the high the high performing momentum stocks were not even close to that you know they were down around maybe 10 to 12 percent too like tough that. to time that stuff you know when we see them and they they whiz by and you have these big high flyers I always look and say but what is it doing for me like even if i play them even if i play a, a momentum stock which is great there's people that do it really well I'm like, what do I get money once? And I got to be right quite often in order to make money. Like, I'd rather just have a company that pays me. And, and as long as I don't sell it and it's still a successful company and it's a good solid company, it's going to keep paying me. It's just a period of time before it's paid for itself and I'm, and I'm getting gravy. Um, and what are the tax implications of selling in and out of stocks? It's short-term capital gains and taxes, ordinary income. And then if you have a bunch of loss, you can't use it. You can only use it against your gain unless you qualify as a trader, which we don't even like to. It's a dirty word in my world. Uh, yeah, the other thing is if a price, say, uh, you know, you get a, one of these high flying tech company like, uh, like Tesla, and it runs up to $880 a share. Um, if it comes back down to $600 a share, you've lost all of that value, right? That's, that's, you haven't realized it if you, unless you've sold it, but you've lost all of that, particularly if you're watching your account go up and down, right? But if it pays a dividend along the way and you accumulate more shares, that's, that's value that you don't really lose because of price fluctuation, right? So it's absolutely true because at some point it's paid for itself. Yeah. You know, so if you're looking at a dividend that's a 3%, you're 33 years away from, having the stock paid for hundred percent, it just paid for itself. And again, you're giving you all the money you invested in it back and you could, you know, in your in theory, you're, you're investing it or, you know, it's, you're getting it back in more shares. And so you have twice as many shares um, as that what you purchase, which is again, same thing It's you're getting something in return, uh, which is what we like, which is what I like. I think you like it. Um, it sounds like these guys like it. They like, they like, they like a company that actually has a compounder built in. And I've, I've never really understood why people are doing the other. I, I call it gambling. If, if you're not getting something and you're hoping something goes up, that's gambling. You, you know, either you're hoping it goes up or you're, or you're, or you're doing like the hedge funds and you're hoping it goes down and you're shorting the hell out of these companies. And now the Reddit crowd is out there after you, you know, they're, they're going to AMC you or they're going to eh, GameStop you. You know, you got to be watching that too. Is the, the jig is up or the gig is up? You know, and it's like we we know what you guys are doing, and we're going to stop you. Yeah. Um, so for the long term, what you want is exponential growth, and you can either bet on one of two things: that you're either going to get exponential growth in price, mm -hmm. right? So you buy a hundred shares, and you're hoping for exponential growth in price, or you can accumulate shares. And quite honestly, if price did almost nothing you'd still get compound growth, but price is probably going to go up in a linear manner over a long period of time. So you're getting the compound impacts of that linear growth. As opposed your, earnings to are, your earnings are almost forced up because of just inflation. Yeah. I've always looked at saying, you know, you want to battle inflation, you know, run a business because the inflation will go up along with it. If I'm selling, a, if I'm a grocery store, I'm just passing on the cost in my, but my margin is going to, perhaps be a little, it's going to be a larger number, same percentage, larger number. So it help it helps combat that. What were your big takeaways after, after going through this? And again, I, I'd welcome people to please read uh, Brian's article because he has the numbers in there. Great read, easy read. Uh, we're going to feature it on the website. We're going to get everybody to actually take a look at this because I think it was so profound, but what were your big, what were your big takeaways? Um, actually, I would recommend that people read the first three to four chapters of Siegel's book and they'll get better information than I, I tried to summarize this kind of thing. But my, my big takeaways, 
uh, was there's a difference between total returns and market value. So dividends matter. So you're gonna be looking at dividends as a key ingredient to your, uh, your portfolio. Uh, most stocks that you hear about in the news are overpriced and a way to measure both price and uh, investor expectations, which get reflected in price, is to take a look at that PE ratio. Um, so not only look at something that's got a PE ratio, or average PE ratio that's reasonable, but also look at your buy time and see if, if even compared to itself, that particular stock is expensive right now or if it's at a, at a good buy point. Um, and then uh, actually the, the, one of the final takeaways was that um, diversification is great if you don't want to put, if you don't want to manage your own money, Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to manage your money and have control of the future and have a very high probability of beating the index um, if, if by a, a, a sizable margin, that uh, if you concentrate your money in things of greater, uh, greater value uh, than over the long haul, you're going to um, win out a much higher, a much higher rate. So uh, other than, you know, little things about taxes and things like that, the taxes and the fees associated with trading in and out of the stocks are, uh, can have a ding on your performance as well. Um, he also, it was funny, he noted that there were no tech stocks in the top 20, uh, even though some of the companies, IBM is, you know, is a good company and uh, so, things like that, but there were no tech companies in the, in the, in the top producers. You get Tootsie Roll and Coca-Cola and, uh, and Philip Morris and stuff like that. Right. Big boring. So you're eating candy while you're smoking your cigarette and drinking your soda. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not good for your health, but good for your portfolio. Right? Yeah, you better get, you, you better get some health stocks while you're at it because you're going to have diabetes and you're going to, you're going to have some in ulcers. Um, I shouldn't say that. That's mean. Um, but it is, it, hey, it, it's it, it, well, when we're looking at our total diversification formula, this is sitting squarely in step number one, where you're doing your, 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 uh, 30% of your portfolio is in, uh, is in these types of stocks where you're, you're, you're buying your, your value stocks, your, your, your diversified ETFs are sitting in the, the managed money 30%. And then none of this is real estate. This is all about the, the market. So the, the maximum exposure you'd have to the market is about 60% uh, when you talk about just, just regular old stocks and, and, and ETFs. So, but you could do fantastic with it. Like the, I think a big takeaway for me is I'm a big believer in sitting on things and sitting on your hands. Uh, you mentioned Buffett, so I'll bring up his buddy Munger. And uh, Munger said the hardest thing you can do as an investor is, is, you know, is take that right hand and put it under your butt cheek and take your left hand and put it under the other butt cheek and just sit on them. Uh, it's hard to sit there and wait, but uh, I would say to people like don't just kind of forget that you bought it and let it do its thing. And here you have these companies. And if you let those things steep long enough, wow, the returns are astronomical, astronomical, just amazing that I'm still blown away by the Philip Morris. Uh, yeah. If you had just put a thousand bucks there, it would be worth 50, 46 million. It's like, holy kashmoli. That's just crazy. Well, the other, my other big takeaway was mm -hmm. everything I read in there reinforced exactly what Infinity has been teaching for as long as I've been a part of it, uh, which was from the beginning. So uh, um, I think you were spot on with what you were targeting. And I know you've tweaked things around the edges a little bit. By the way, your diversification is asset class diversification, right? Not yeah. diversification among, you get some among the stocks, but you're saying, hey, own some real estate, own some other asset yep. classes. We steal that too. That's the Yale model. Of, you know, you're just trying to go into different classes and also diversification of ideas. The reason I say manage money is because I make mistakes. I'm a human being and I can't see my own blind spots. I won't know they're there. So you get somebody else because they're going to help smooth out and, and, and shed some light into those blind spots. And so what, I, what I've noticed is by letting other people manage portfolios, it's not so much the return that's different. It's the ideas that they're looking at when they're articulating it, that is different. And it's like anything, if you have a community of traders, if you have a community of investors around you, if you have people that are actually engaged in it, they're going to see things that you don't. 
And so, I mean, look, look at yourself, Brian, you're a, you've been a full-time trader. You've, you, you know, I know you, you're an artist or you're a, a writer and you're, you're doing a lot of those things that you love to do, but you're reading about, you're reading other works and Siegel's works were what, what from 2005 and, you know, like we're, we're looking at, and they're still being quoted today. I think he's mentioned uh, previously, like before we were talking about it, it was just mentioned in an article today as we're looking at all the interest rates. These principles don't change, guys. It's the same principles. It's stuff that was written 2,000 years ago. You can go back and look at uh, look at biblical text, and it's a lot of the same principles that they're saying that actually works, and it's just reinforcing and making sure that your your, your mindset is set, that you're like, hey, I'm not trying to I'm not having that anxiety of I'm missing out, you know, that fear of missing out or Reddit calls it FOMO, right? It's, it's, I don't want to get taken up in that emotion because that emotion will make me do things that are not logical. And so the diversification really comes down to getting those other ideas and making sure that you're keeping yourself in check because we all do crazy stuff and we all get nervous. We all get anxious. We always, we can be our own worst enemy. And now you have somebody else you're watching what they're doing and they might be saying, Hey, slow down. You know, here's what, you, you know, here's what we're seeing. And you're like, Oh, you know, I didn't even think about that. Thank you. And you take the anxiety level down. And I found that to be invaluable. Just talking to guys like you, like you're sitting here and you've done a thoughtful analysis of something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize is that those indexes, beat money managers 92% of the time over a 15 year horizon. Like they kicked the snot out of the, the traders too. Well, now I'm like taking another level. Well, you want to kick the snot out of the index, pick the individual stocks that meet these criteria. And, you know, you don't have to be right 100% of the time, but if you happen to have gotten a hold of, uh, of, of Philip Morris and Altria, we were still talking Altria last year was one of our faves. It's up 30% since we were recommending it. Um, but if you had just been lucky enough to be in one of those, like you, you didn't even have to pick any of the other ones correctly. <laughs> like you could have just had a bunch of dogs and you'd still be way ahead of the index, and you, which would be way ahead of the traders. Right. So it's just, get, it's just increasing your chances of success. And, and what you said is spot on. And the community helps a lot, exactly like you said, not only diversification of opinions, but if you just watched your infinity presentation every month when you do that, um, it just re-stabilizes uh, you. When you might get caught up in all the market sentiment, you might be thinking, oh, I need to buy me some AMC stock or some GameStop or you know something like to join the Reddit crowd because they're making tons of money. Um, it, you, it just You've got that reinforcement on a regular basis that says, stick with principles that work over the long I still, haul. I still gamble. I still like that stuff. <laughs> like I, I go and I bought some Doge just so I could say I can't, I did like a hundred bucks. Now it's worth 3000 or some stupid number. But I was like, you know, like my, my trainer comes up and says, should I be buying AMC? And I said, no, it's gambling. Well, should I buy it? It's gambling. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Like, it doesn't make sense to buy, but it's fun. You want to stick your thumb in the eye of Wall Street? Buy some. And then hold it forever. They, they called it uh, HODL, hold, hold on for dear life. Like just sit on it, forget that you bought it. You might lose it all, but it's going to annoy the hell out of some hedge fund. <laughs> yep. They're going to have to cover higher. So it's, you know, part of it is that is that a little bit of joy. No, but uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on. I don't want to take more of your time, but I just, I loved uh, reading this and I was like, Let's let, let let's articulate this, have a conversation about it and share it with as many people as we can. So I'm going to record this and send it out to everybody that I know of, Brian, and we're going to get it out to our group because I think it's important that people realize uh, when you back test this stuff, it does work. And it's we're not the only ones out there talking about it. There's some really smart people that saw it way before we ever started even thinking about it. Well, thanks a lot. I enjoyed the time to sit and chat for a bit. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian.